This video is going to be a review of the Chapter 12 material from the Modern Refrigeration 20th Edition textbook. Now, if you have not read the chapter yet, or if you do not have access to the book, I strongly suggest you do take a look at the book and read the chapter, because a review as we do in maybe 20 minutes doesn't take the place of reading the whole chapter. So the objectives of this chapter is that we can identify the parts of an atom, we can use Ohm's law to explain the mathematical relationship among voltage, current, and resistance. We can contrast the properties and applications of static electricity, direct current, and alternating current. We need to be able to summarize the three types of materials used in electrical and electronic parts and systems. We need to be able to design diagrams of series, parallel, and series parallel circuits. We need to be able to use formulas to calculate the voltage drop across an electrical load. Then we want to be able to list the components of an electromagnetic and factors that affect the strengths of its magnetic field. We want to explain how electrical generators use magnetism to create electricity. And you want to be able to summarize how electricity flows between coils of a transformer. So let's start off with the easy part and the most basic principles of electricity. It's the atom. Okay, an atom is made up of protons, which is positively charged particles of nucleus, neutrons, which are particles of the nucleus having no charge, and electrons, they're negatively charged particles that orbit the nucleus. So for electricity, which is electron flow, the negative I, an atom from a negative ion jumps to another atom, which then becomes negatively charged. Then the atom gives up an electron, which jumps to another atom, and the chain reaction continues to occur. So electricity is the movement of electrons from one negative ion to another atom. Then that atom becomes negatively charged, and so on and so forth. So it's electrons moving. Electromotive force is the potential difference in atomic charges. Voltage is EMF. It's electrical pressure generated by a power source. It's measured in volts. A volt is the amount of electronic force that's required to send one ampere of current through resistance of one ohm. So again, one volt is the EMF or electromotive force required to send one amp of current through the resistance of one ohm. Current is the flow of electrons. They're measured in amps. Okay, one amp is one coulomb per second. A coulomb is an electrical charge in 6.24 times 1018 electrons. In other words, a very large number of electrons. Okay, so again, what we really need to know, current is the flow of electrons. It's measured in amps. So if we look at a simple uh, analogy of electricity and water, okay, voltage is like water pressure. Current is like the flow of water. The greater the pressure, the more flow. Okay. Again, voltage is like water pressure. Current is like the flow of water. The greater the pressure, the more flow, as long as everything else is the same. And if you look over here on the right, you'll see the diagram. The one on the left, you have less pressure because it, there's a less amount of water in the bucket at the top. Same pipe pressure, same pipe diameters, okay, but you have less flow then you the amount you would get with the taller water column, which is the higher water level, more pressure. There's a relationship between voltage and current. Okay. It's the same relationship we had with the amount of water. So if I on the left hand side have one battery compared to the right hand side, two batteries, the two battery has a higher amount of voltage light bulb burns brighter than the one on the left, which is the one battery. 
We have one more component to talk about of electrical behavior. It's called resistance. It's measured in ohms. One ohm of resistance allows one volt to conduct one amp. Resistors provide specific levels of resistance. Current through resistors generate heat. Now that's a pretty important concept because we're going to use that as we move through the program. Current through resistance generates heat. But resistance is in ohms. One ohm of resistance allows one volt to conduct one amp. Now, all of these things come together when we talk about Ohm's law. Okay, Ohm's law is the, is the formula and the relationship between voltage, current, and resistance. So the easiest way to remember this is to think about this as this pie chart, E over I times R, or next to each other. Any, remember, any letter over another is division any letter next to each other is multiplication. So if you want to find voltage, which is E, why E? Because it's electromotive force. Okay, we take, uh, we have to know I and R, current or amperage and resistance. So voltage is I times R. Again, if you cover up the portion you're trying to find, put your finger over E, I times R. R is E divided by I. Okay, so if you want to find resistance, you have to know voltage and current. To solve for current, you would cover up I, and it's E over R. Best way to remember Ohm's Law? Draw yourself a pie chart and just know how to draw that. You'll never mess it up. Capacitance is the ability of a material to store a charge in an electrostatic field. It's measured in farads or microfarads. One farad equals one coulomb on a capacitor surface with a potential difference of one volt. Okay, capacitors used to provide capacitance. It's classified di by dielectrical material. It's used in single phase motor circuits and it's used on control circuit boards. But again, capacitance, know that it's measured in farads or microfarads. Never assume a capacitor has been discharged. Before handling a capacitor used in a motor circuit, drain off its charge with a 20 K ohm resistor. Where insulated gloves could put capacitor in a box, place a 20 K ohm resistor across both terminals for a few seconds. Do not ever touch a capacitor that's been in a circuit without discharging that capacitor first. The static electricity is an accumulation of electric charge. Okay, it's electricity at rest. It's a negative charge. There's going to be more electrons than protons can have a positive charge, which has more protons than electrons. Okay, in HVAC applications, the motor capacitor helps the motor start. It's also used, used in electrostatic air cleaners. Current electricity moves electrons along a conductor. There's two types of cur electric current. You have direct current and you have alternating current. Direct current as the electron flow in one direction. It's produced by batteries. Okay, you notice the electron flow comes through one direction. That's direct current. Alternating current, electrons first flow in one direction, then in the other direction. The frequency of alternating current is how many cycles per second Okay, a full cycle is what you're seeing here. One cycle of alternating current, starting off to a positive, going to a negative, and back to zero. It's measured in hertz. One hertz is one cycle per second. Now, it's very important to know that 60 hertz is 60 cycles per second, and in North America, that is what the frequency of all alternating current is supposed to be. Conductors are materials that allow electrons to flow easily. 
atoms have free electrons. Voltage makes electrons travel from one atom to another atom. Most are metal. C copper, silver, and aluminum are great conductors. Some are better conductors than others. Wires carry electricity and they can be solid or stranded. Insulators resist electron flow. They could be glass, wood, paper, mica, rubber, or plastics. They almost have no free electrons. They're used to stop electron flow. The perfect vacuum is also an insulator. It's used on conductors to guide current through a circuit. So again, we have insulated wire and bare wire. We have stranded, we have solid. The insulation is around the wire, on the insulated wires, and not around it on the bare wire. Bare wire you'll usually only find in a, in a equipment ground. Semiconductors are insulators that become conductors under certain circumstances. Could be silicon, germanium. They're used in transistors, diodes, photocells, and silicon-controlled rectifiers, SCRs. It's the basis of all electronics, and they're used as switches and relays. You'll find them on circuit boards. An electrical circuit provides a complete path for electrons. Has to have a power source, have to have a conductor, has to have an electrical load. The circuit's pin can be open, in other words, a broken circuit, or closed, which is a complete circuit. The diagram on the right shows an open circuit because that switch is open. There's no complete path for electricity to flow. By the way, the top picture, the top diagram is a schematic. The bottom diagram is a pictorial. A series circuit is where you have a single path for electrons to flow. In other words, we flow out of the battery through bulb one, through bulb two, and through bulb three. Okay. The amperage in a series circuit is constant. The voltage across each load adds up to the source. So let me say that again. Series circuit, single path for electrons to flow. The amperage in a series circuit is the same any place in the circuit. The voltage across each load, if you put a voltmeter measured from one line to the other on each load, it would add up to the source voltage. In this case, this is a DC circuit using a battery. We have another type of circuit. We have a parallel circuit. In the case of a parallel circuit, all loads get full source voltage. In other words, load one, two, and three all get 12 volts because all are connected directly to both sides of the power supply. The amperage for each branch of the circuit adds up to the total amperage. So each branch will have its own circuit. Now, the key here on a parallel circuit is, let's say this light bulb burns out, light bulb one burns out. Light bulbs two and three will continue to operate. In a series circuit, if light bulb one burns out, light bulbs two and three will also cease to operate because any open in this circuit kills the entire circuit. In this case, if the bulb has an open filament, the other bulbs will continue to operate. In the HVAC industry, series circuits are used for safeties for the most part. Okay, safety controls are all wired in series. If any safety control opens, we want the circuit to cease to operate. In a, Parallel circuits are most often used for the load side of the system, the part that does the work, because we want every load, which will be motor, heater, everything else, to get full source voltage. Sometimes we have a combination of a series and parallel circuit. 
Okay, they're called combination circuits. Treat them as two separate circuits. Work on your parallel side first and then your series side. But we'll get more into that. Voltage drop is the amount of electrical pressure applied to a load. An electrical load is a device that offers resistance to current and it must perform work or a function. Unintentional electrical loads can cause unintentional voltage drop and they can cause circuits to malfunction. Examples of unintentional electrical loads are, could be dirty contacts, poorly made electrical connections, and conductors that are too small for the application. To measure voltage drop, okay, we can take a meter, okay, and we can put an ammeter in and we can measure the resistance of a circuit. Or you can just take a meter lead and put it across the load, okay, put it in parallel with the load. Magnetism, we got to talk a little bit about because all of our motors, all of our power and everything is, gener is using magnetism. We use magnetism quite a lot in the HVAC industry, okay? We know that all magnets have north and south poles. Like poles repel each other, unlike poles attract. There's magnetic flux, that's the lines of force connecting the poles. Okay. The magnetic field is the space in which the magnetic force operates. We have two types of magnetism. We have permanent magnetism and we have induced magnetism. Permanent magnets are made of hardened steel. Once magnetized, they remain magnetized. Induced magnetism is when you're magnetizing a material when it's placed in a magnetic field. It forms the basis for electromagnetic construction. So electromagnetism, it's magnetism caused by passing electrical current through a conductor. A magnetic field disappears when the current is turned off. Electromagnetic components is a core and a winding. So we take an iron core, we wind a wire around it, and we send electricity through that wire. Okay, we create a magnetic field that also has a north side and a south side. The strength of electromagnets are based on four factors, the number of turns in a winding and the strength of the current, the core material in construction and the length of the coil. Magnoemotive force, MMF, is the amount of energy used to generate a magnetic field. It's determined by the number of turns in a coil and the strength of the current. It's measured in amper turn, amp turns. MMF is the number of turns times the amp slowing through the winding. So, an AC generator, alternating current generator, is one example of how we use a magnetic field. The wire loop rotates through a magnetic field and it generates alternating current. To maintain the electrical connections, slip rings and brushes are used. What rotates the wire? Could be a gas engine, could be hydroelectric, could be wind. But because of that rotation through the magnetic field, we're going to generate power. A DC generator operates in the same way as an AC generator. So let's talk about transformers. Now remember, transformers are devices that change voltages in circuits. Okay, the principle is basically we use, an we use electricity to generate a magnetic field. The magnetic field then can be used to induce electricity on another circuit. Induction is the transfer of electricity using a magnetic field. A transformer has two parts, primary coil, and a secondary coil. So this is an example of a step-down transformer. 
okay? We take 120 volts in on the primary coil. We generate, electro, we generate an electromagnetic field. The transformer core becomes magnetized, okay? And actually conducts that magnetic field to the secondary coil, which is also wound around the core. Now, because the primary coil has more windings than the secondary coil, we drop the voltage coming out of the transformer in whatever, per in whatever percentage of the turns. See, the primary side might have 100 turns, 120 volts coming in with 100 turns. It's proportional. We have 50 turns on the output side, on the secondary side. So I'm dropping that voltage by half. Okay, 120 volts in, 60 volts out. Now, in most cases in HVAC, we're going to have 120 volts in or 240 or 460 in, and we're going to be pulling 24 volts out. But again, step down transformer, primary side is the high voltage. It's a load. It uses electricity. Secondary side is a supply. It provides power to another portion of the circuit. Step up transformer does this exactly backwards. You see these in gas furnace ignition as well as oil furnace ignition. 120 volts in, 240 or higher volts out. And again, it's just reversing the number of turns proportionately. 50 turns on the input side and 100 turns in the output side. Now the key is that whatever the current is on the in versus the out, okay, if I have, if I have one amp here, I'm only going to put out half an amp here. Okay, so the current also changes the available current. So there is a transformer formula, okay? We use four values, primary voltage, secondary voltage, number of turns of the wire in the primary coil, number of turns of wire in the secondary coil. If you have three of the four numbers, you can find the remaining value. Okay, again, using math, if you have any three of these values, you can find your remaining number. So that's an overview of what was covered in chapter 12. Again, if you haven't read the chapter, please go do so.